Dear Yasha, Robert, thank you for joining me in this conversation about Elias Ashmo. Ashmo is a figure that has impacted English Freemasonry history, and with it, the way that we experience our Masonic journey still today. During separate conversation with both of you, I have been presented Elias Ashmo as a character larger than life, Yasha. An opportunistic man that uses the system at his own advantage, while coincidentally doing some good to Freemasonry. Robert, such disparity of view has triggered my curiosity and my interest in learning more from you two fascinating people in Freemasonry and your views about Ashmo, hence this recording. Rules of engagement. Yash and Robert will alternate in sharing their view and presenting us with fact, examples and historical events that have shaped English Freemasonry. They will also have the possibility to challenge each other and ultimately present a closing argument to make up our minds. In order to, to make this exercise holistic and involving, we will ask uh, a group of experts on Elias' life or Freemason history, scholars, and ask their opinion about Yasha and Robert's uh, presentation. However, what is the real goal of, of all of us? It's not just about judging an historical figure. In fact, we all aim at triggering your Masonic curiosity, the listener. We want to motivate you to look at this video to go further than that, read, learn, study about this and other historical figures, and from it, finding new joy in, in your Masonic journey. Allow me to introduce you Elias Ashmole based on the profile on the Ashmolean Museum. Elias Ashmole was born in 1617 in Litchfield, Staffordshire. He died in May 1692 at the age of 74. Occupation, antiquarian, politician, officer of arms, astrologer and alchemist. Elias Ashmole was born in Bread Market Street, Litchfield, Staffordshire. His family had been prominent, but its fortune declined by the time of his birth. In 1633, 16 years old, he went to live in London as mentor to Paget's sons, and in 38, five years later, with the help of James Paget's help, he qualified as a solicitor. He enjoyed a successful legal practice in London and married Eleanor Mainwaring, a member of a Declasse Cheshire aristocratic family who died while pregnant, only three years later. Still in his early 20s, Ashmole had taken the first step towards status and wealth. Ashmo supported the side of Charles I in the Civil War. At the outbreak of fighting in 1642, he left London for the house of his father-in-law, Peter Mainwaring of Smallwood, Cheshire. There, he lived a retired life until 1644, where he was appointed King's Commissioner at Exire at Lichfield. Soon afterwards, a suggestion of George Wharton a leading astrologer with strong court connections, Ashmole was given a military post at Oxford, where he served as an ordnance officer for the king's forces. In his spare time, he studied mathematics and physics at his lodging, Brasenose College. There, he acquired a deep interest in astronomy, astrology and magic. In late 1645, he left Oxford to accept the position of Commissioner of Excise at Worcester. The other occult science that fascinated Ashmole was alchemy, of which he wrote the Facilicum Chemicus in 1650, and thereafter he wrote more books, the Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum, 1652, the History of the Order of the Garter, 55, and the Way to Bliss in 1658. The restoration of Charles II in 1660 brought an upturn to his fortunes. His known loyalty to the Stuart made him a favorite at court, 
and brought intangible rewards in the way of places and offices. Freemasonry. His diary in 16 October 1646 reads, in part, I was made a Freemason at Warrington in Lancashire with Colonel Henry Mainwaring. Although there is no, only one other mention of Masonic activity in his diary, he seems to have remained in good standing and well connected with the fraternity, as he was still attending meetings in 1682. In fact, that year, March 10th, he writes, About 5 hours p.m., I received a summons to appear at the lodge to held the next day at Mason's Hall, London. The following day, March 11, he writes, Accordingly, I went. I was the senior fellow among them. It has been 35 years since I was admitted. We all dine at the Half Moon Tavern in Cheapside, at a noble diner prepared at the charges of the new accepted Masons. Ashmole's notes are one of the earliest references to Freemasonry known in England, but apart from this entry in his autobiographical notes, there are no further details about Ashmole's involvement. This concludes my introduction to Elias Ashmole. I would like now to ask Yasha to begin with his opening statement. Yasha, you have our undivided attention. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, Antonio, since I'm the first speaker, let me first of all say thank you very much for all your efforts in organizing this event and chairing uh, the, the actual debate as such. Thank you. I need to start by saying that both Robert and I agree on the basic principles of Ashmore's character. Where we differentiate, where we have got differences of opinion, is on, his, on the motivation of his actions resulting from these characteristics as a gentleman. I think Alanis Ashmore was 100% okay. Whereas in paperwork and uh, in uh, disclosures of um, pre-debate documents that so far I've seen, my colleague here has got opinions that differ completely. And it is my intention to show that he is wrong in his opinions and that most importantly, in his approach to Freemason in the 17th century, he's got under a total misapprehension of what Freemasonry actually meant at the time, which is what I intend to show. That is the conclusion of my uh, opening statement uh, as a, as a as a second speaker, I only hope that uh, my colleague will stick to the original arguments that you made in the paperwork you presented to me. <laughs> Keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> he doesn't change his mind. <laughs> Thank you, Yasha. Robert, it is now time for you to present us with your opening statement. You have the same time as Yasha. And now, Robert, you have our undivided attention. Thank you. And thank you again for organizing the debate. Well, I agree with the basic facts. He was born in Litchfield in 1617, and his father was a humble saddler. And his mother was related to Baron James Paget, uh, but she was thought to have married beneath herself. So in my opinion, Ashmole inherited a sense of entitlement from his mother, which inclined him to make use of people and then move on for the rest of his life. Let me just give you one or two examples. At the age of 16, he moved in with Paget as a tutor in London and got a taste for more refined living. And at that time, he began to keep his diary, which is one useful source of information about him. And when I combined it with the technique of multi-viewpoint timeline analysis, helped me build a picture of his activities. Now, through Paget, Asmole met Peter Mannering of Smallwood, Cheshire, who had a daughter, Eleanor, who was unmarried, and who her father thought was getting too close to a sell-by date for comfort. Eleanor was 14 years older than Ashmole when he married her in uh, 1638. She was an elderly spinster, but she came with a small endowment. Uh, where, but unfortunately, she died in childbirth in 1641, leaving Ashmole with a small private income. He was 21, she was 35. She was 38, when that was when they married. She was 38 when, he, when she died. Ashmore was 24. Uh, 
At this time, his royalist sympathies were making life difficult for him in London, so he moved in with his father-in-law in Cheshire for a few months, and Mannering gave him work as a solicitor. And later that year, he moved down to Oxford to be near the deposed court of Charles I. Uh, whilst he was there, he became what's called a stranger at Brasenose College. He never took a degree, and his purpose of moving there was to stay with his uncle by marriage, uh, marriage Sir Henry Mannering, who sponsored him to stay at the college. Now, whilst he was staying in Oxford, he made friends with Colonel Wharton, who shared his interest in astrology. And Ashmole persuaded Wharton to appoint him as one of the king's four masters of ordinance of the city. And despite no obvious military expertise, he was given command of a troop of gunners. And he used this to impress the lieutenant of ordinance, Sir John Hayden. Having dumped Wharton, Hayden became his new best friend by helping plan the defence of Oxford against an attack by Cromwell's army. Uh, Ashmole persuaded Hayden to recommend him to Lord Jacob Astley, who was in charge of the Royalist defences of Worcester. Now, having dumped Hayden, he got himself appointed Commissioner of Excise by ingratiating himself with Lords Ashley, Brereton and Sir Guilford Gerard, the King's Governor of Worcester, all, all in his diary. His diary records how much time he spent with his tailor to dress to impress the bigwigs while helping plan an expedition to relieve Chester, which never happened. He did manage to persuade Colonel Washington to appoint him Master of Ordinance for Worcester, and soon after Oxford fell to the Royalists, and after the King surrendered to Cromwell in Newark, Worcester surrendered. Ashmole is recorded as being among the officers who surrendered, and he was formally exiled from London. And I'll leave the story there because it gets worse. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Robert, for this opening. Now, according to our schedule, you have the time for uh, your main argument. I thought it was a main argument. There's <laughs> more to come if you want to. Do you mind me to continue? Please. <clears throat> well, we left him formally exiled from London. He was exiled from London, so he promptly went to Warrington. He didn't stay there long, uh, where he'd arranged for his cousin by marriage, Colonel Henry Mannering, a member of Cromwell's army, to propose to him as a mason in the Warrington Lodge, now known as the Lodge of Lights. And that day he borrowed enough money from Colonel Henry to buy a horse in Congleton and set off to London, where as a mason he was received to mix freely with astrologers, alchemists and mathematicians. Among those was William Lilly. Lilly was a well-established astrologer and writer of a much respected university textbook on Christian astrology and a strong supporter of Parliament. Uh, becoming a Freemason had certainly changed Ashmole's fortunes to make him acceptable to a man like that. Now, his new circle of friends involved William Autry, the mathematician, alchemist and astrologer, an inventor of the slide rule, also a parliamentarian. And among Autry's friends were Seth Ward, Jonas Moore, Thomas Henshaw, Christopher Wren, William Lilly, George Wharton, Thomas Wharton, Edward Gunter, the, guest, the Gresham Professor of Astronomy. And within a year, Ashmole became a regular visitor to Gresham College. And this was the institution which was so important as a meeting place for the founder members of the Royal Society. So by 1652, he was so well established in London that he was visited by John Wilkins and Christopher Wren, no less. Wilkins was a successful parliamentarian academic, warden of Wadham College and the husband of Rabina, the sister of Oliver Cromwell. Now, this is not to suggest that Ashmole took much interest in Freemasonry once he'd used it to once he'd used it to ingratiate himself to the parliamentary rulers. He was much more interested in marrying a wealthy widow. So, after trying and failing with half a dozen possibles, he finally managed to seduce another member of his late wife's family, Lady Mary Mannering. He, she'd been married three times before, so Ashmole was her fourth husband. She was fifty-two and he was 32, but she was rich. However, it wasn't a happy marriage, and she tried to leave him, but he was too attached to her money to let her go. The marriage took place despite the opposition of the bride's family, and it did not prove to be harmonious. Lady Mannering filed suit for separation and alimony some seven years after the betrothal, but her action was dismissed by the courts in 1657, and she died in 1668, 
uh, age 71. Now, her marriage gave Ashwall a access to her husband's estates. Her first husband had large estates in Bradfield in Berkshire, and it left him wealthy enough to pursue his interests, including botany and alchemy, without concern for having to learn a living. Now, he arranged, he arranged for his friend George Walton to be released from prison uh, for writing libelous satires about Parliament to manage Mary's estates on his behalf. And uh, he next used Mary's money to buy his way into John Tradison's affections by funding a catalogue of Tradison's collection of exotic plants, mineral specimens and curiosities from around the world. Tradison left the collection to Ashmole after his death against his family's wishes, and Ashmole used it to establish the Ashmolean Museum, uh, but his determined aggression to obtaining the collection for himself led to Hester, Tradison's widow, to drown herself in her own garden pond. Everything I discovered about Ashmole leads me to believe he was nothing more than an ambitious, ingratiating social climber who stole a hero's legacy for his own glorification. Hester contested the deed, claiming her husband had signed it when Ashmole had got him blind drunk without knowing its contents. But the matter was settled in Chancery in Ashmole's favour some two years later. Let's return to, he's, uh, he's just managed to, uh, to win legal control of the collection. Now, after Mary's death, uh, literally a couple of months afterwards, Ashmore found himself another spinster with assets, and his father wanted to marry her off because she was getting near a sell-by date as well. She was Elizabeth Dugdale, and she was 36 years old, while Ashmore was 51. Ashmore at the time was Windsor Herald, and he was writing a book on the Order of the Garter, which he hoped would win in favour with Charles II. Now, it seems his motive for marrying her was partly to gain esteem, as she was the daughter of William Dugdale, who was then Garter King of Arms. But I strongly suspect he wanted to father an heir. Now, Elizabeth fell pregnant three times, but they all ended in stillbirths or miscarriages. Had he fathered a son, I doubt he would have left his dubiously acquired hordes to the Bodleian and the Ashmolean Museum. So throughout his life, he used influ influential individuals, wives and institutions to gain social prestige. For example, he joined the Royal Society, but he never bothered attending. He just paid for the privilege of being listed as a supporter of Charles II. He joined Freemasonry, and once he got access to the parliamentary hierarchy through Wilkins, he uh, didn't bother attending very often again. So he tended to use people and then moved on. I mean, he used Henry and uh, Colonel Henry Mannering to get him into Warrington Lodge and then never spoke to him again for the rest of his life. So he did have a tendency to use people and dump them. So I don't think the king was taken in by him, though, because when he tried to stand for Parliament for Litchfield in uh, 1678, he wasn't elected, but he tried again in 1685. And he was then forced to sell his votes, because it wasn't Rotten Borough, to Charles II's preferred candidate. I think I'll leave my argument with this comment by Richard Garnett's entry in the 1891 Dictionary of National Biography to sum up my cause. Acquisitiveness was his master passion. Thank you, Robert. Yasha, your argument. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, very much. I don't know where to start my argument. <laughs> <laughs> Please try and rescue him. I'd like to think better of him than I do. <clears throat> well, I hope so. The bottom line of my argument is that actually Ashmole had nothing to defend, nothing to worry about, and that he was respected in his own right. That far from soliciting advancement, he was actually invited to join the organizations which, because of his status and standing in any case, in the first place. But to come to the argument you have put forward, um, I selected out of the criticisms you've got on Ashmore, I selected four that you've pinpointed. Either, well, you've repeated them to some extent now, but previously I'm actually quoting you 
the one, the very first one on avarice, that he was a man, I mean, this was your last sentence here on this, on this presentation just now. As far as avarice is concerned, I don't see anything wrong with a man, a young man, succeeding in, that is not from the aristocracy, obviously, so he has got no family money, seeking a rich widow in order to be able to advance his ambitions in life or to, to study with, in, with a peaceful mind. That is no, no worse than a groom accepting a dowry from his wife's family, from his future wife's family. I don't see any more disgrace in that than there is in, in seeking funds. I think, I mean, the way we should judge this is by what he did with the money. If you were to argue that, he, that he, all of the money that he got from his uh, widows who he had married went into gambling, into gaming, or into uh, false investments, or but no. Ashmol actually used the money finally at the total end product, doesn't matter how he got there at the end, by insisting that the Ashmolean Museum is actually founded and, and uh, filled with his collection, and of course his library to the Bodleian, which, uh, which complemented that. So this is a way to judge whether, I mean, I'm not denying that he was Acquisitive, yes. I mean, there's no question that it was acquisitive, I agree, and uh, the collection. Um, you raised a few points that I would like to... Trandescant, for example. Uh, yes, you're right that he accumulated his collection, he joined his collection together with that of Trandescant. But his own collection got burnt, Alias Ashmo's collection got burnt, a lot of it got burnt in a temple fire, in the temple in, in the Inn of Court, fire. So this contribution finally to the Ashmolean was more of the Trandescan collection than his own, which wouldn't have been the case had there not been a fire and so on. The coin collection, incidentally, is entirely his. Uh, you also mentioned that he was, uh, the catalogs that he did of the coin collection of the, of the royal family, that was also by, he was the actual author, he was the actual cataloger of the collection. It wasn't just that he financed it. The second aspect that you mentioned is that um, is a question of him being a failed academic. I mean, I just find this such an illogical argument because the only reason they are giving that argument was because he spent time in Oxford uh, at the university premises, which quite correctly in his description was his lodgings. He studied there, but he was not a member of the university. Nowhere along his career as he actually claimed to have been an Oxfordian graduate. In fact, he never claimed to be a, a university graduate of any kind. He was just a successful, very successful lawyer and a solicitor. And that was, that was his qualification as far as he was concerned. So uh, his contribution to literature are even more I think there are m more books than you did, than you published. <laughs> I, I've, done, well, I've done 28. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you had... He's short of a number, I have to say. <laughs> uh, so he wasn't even as prolific as you are in it, but he did publish books. <laughs> what is interesting is that those books are still in print today. The alchemic, alchemical ones, one of them, on alchemistry, 2011. Uh, published as recent as 2011. Anyway, I, I can't, I really cannot see that uh, it can be seen in any way as a failed academic. The words that you used with regard to the women, I mean, you keep on mentioning uh, his, his history with women. You actually called him an outrageous womanizer mm -hmm. in writing. I, I'm glad you agree. Well, you seem to me to be looking at 17th century social England from the eyes of a 20, 2011, 2022-21 observer. Prostitution was a perfectly normal activity during the middle of the 17th century in England. To go and spend the night at the brothel for an aristocrat was standard acceptable. It gave his wife the peace of mind that she needed and he could go out and do what he wanted to. There wasn't a moral code of such, I, I mean, there were modesty, but not moral codes, which were of such great consequence. And if you, I direct you maybe to read a few more diaries of the period. 
including, if you wish, Samuel Pepys, who was a contemporary of Ashmore. Samuel Pepys has got to, is highly respected as Ashmore, certainly, has got incidents he describes with exactly the same detail as Ashmore described this to do with women. So, so it seems to me that all your attacks on Freemason, on um, Alliance Ashmore, the only thing wrong with him is the things that you say is wrong with him, not what were wrong, what were wrong. And uh, most importantly, I come to the subject matter of, the, of Freemasonry. We must look at, Freemason, at this attitude of Freemasonry in the period from two different points of view. Ashmore's point of view and Freemasonry itself point of view. From point of view of Ashmore, he had reached a stage in his social life with all the benefits that he had derived from Charles II up to the Restoration. And previous to that, the honors that were given back to him and the monetary gains he had. He was in a status where not only couldn't Freemasonry do anything for him, he didn't need for Freemasonry to do anything for him. But the concept and the idea that Freemasonry was in a position to help somebody with parliamentary and so on, I just don't know where all this comes from. Because we don't have evidence of speculative Freemasonry as, as we understand it till the end of the 17th century at the earliest, till the end of the 17th century. Until then, it is only operative lodges that are actually working. And in fact, his visit in 1682 to the London Masons Company is attending a lodge inside the London Masons Company in 1682. What that meeting was is still not clear today. The evidence given forward, put forward in documentation that is available is that there was a ceremony of exception which was, the, which was a club within a club. Both speculative and operative members of the Mason's company introduced newcomers into their society. Now, all these newcomers that came through the exception are not recorded as necessarily becoming Freemasons. So that we don't know what Freemasonry was. What is quite clear cut is that the speculative lodges were non-existence in a practical point of view. And when Elias Ashmore got initiated in 1646, A, he was invited again to join the Freemasons, and secondly, he might have very well joined as a speculative, not as a speculative, but he must have joined an operative lodge, and not a speculative one. The fact that the Sloan manuscript was coincides with his with the date of his initiation is a very good example that he was being honored by this manuscript being presented to him and not that he was some sort of desperate man needing help uh, which he was gaining through lodges <laughs> but it's very clear to me very clear to me that Elias Ashmole made his way through life on his own initiative his own backing his own cleverness successful solicitor that won the majority of the cases put forward, genuinely interested and capable in advancing his interest in a huge number of subjects from astrology and botany and so forth, to author of books that are of consequence today, including a standard work of reference on the, on the order of the Gata. And that he's ambitious, he might have been over ambitious in life, which unfortunately might be interpreted by gentlemen like yourself as being malicious. Sure. Thank you so much for your counter-argument. Uh, Robert, I saw you were taking notes, so I would like to uh, suggest, if both of you are okay, to actually challenge each other's statements and see what we can actually dig more about the elements that you have presented. Well, can I start by saying, Yasha, I greatly admire your attempt to defend the indefensible. <laughs> You did a remarkable job, but you did make one slight mistake. You claimed he, he, only, he was honoured to join Freemasonry and somebody asked him uh, during the Reformation, uh, during the Reformation, when, uh, sorry, during the, uh, the reign of Charles II. In fact, he joined during the reigns of Charles I when he'd just been kicked out of uh, Worcester and been exiled from London and he had nowhere else to go. And he had, didn't even have enough money to buy a horse, he had to borrow it. Of, uh, of his proposer into Freemasonry, and the very next day he rode straight down to London and uh, got an introduction to Lily, who was a 
who was present at certain of the meetings later. And I have looked at other people's diaries. It's how I built up the picture of what he was doing because I've cross-referenced all the diaries and all the references to him in the multi in the multi-viewpoint timeline. So I can see where he was mitching, where he was going, what days he appeared in different places. And it's very clear he was a refugee. He was penniless. He joined Freemasonry simply to get an introduction. And he got an introduction to Oliver Cromwell's brother-in-law because he brags about it in his diary. And he drags about it because he's been made a Freemason. So he clearly, it's his own words that damn him, not me. I mean, I, I take your viewpoint that uh, that perhaps he uh, he played fast and loose with women, but it wasn't. I'm not bothered about his sexual proclivities. I mean, if he'd been any good at it, he would have had a child, and he didn't succeed. What I'm, what bothers me is the way he simply uses them to squeeze what money he can out of them and then discards them. I find that deeply unpleasant, and nothing to do with his sexual habits at all. He did it with he did it with Eleanor Mannering. He did it with with uh, with Elizabeth Dugdale. She had three miscarriages in an attempt to provide him with an heir. So he was acquisitive. He was. I will agree with you. He's, he was cunning. And he did write some worthy books. But you don't have to be a, a paragon of virtue to write worthy books. Look at me. I cast <laughs> no shadow and have no reflection. <laughs> and yet I've, st I've still sold many millions of books. So that's, no, that's, not a, that's not an argument in his favour. I think he was a very self-centred, highly acquisitive, acquisitive man. And he exploited people to get where he did. I don't deny he was he was cunning and clever. I don't deny that people at the time may not have judged him badly. But I'm afraid I still don't think much of him. <laughs> I, I'd like to hear whether you've got any, any good opinions about him, because everything you seem to say is all negative. I'm afraid it is. I started out with a total neutral viewpoint of him. And then I built the timeline, and I, 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 I cross, it's, been, it's been about two and a half years analysing all the timeline and, and cross-references. But your timeline before, before I wrote The Invisible College, because I was actually interested in Robert Murray. Your uh, timeline seems to be the evidence you're using for everything that is going on. Because there is certainly no evidence of Freemasonry being of any consequence at all whatsoever in the 1640s uh, as to uh, uh, somebody uh, seeking its membership. Apart from the fact that Elias Ashmole used Masonic symbols in all the books he wrote, and also claimed it as his means of getting access to Lily and Orsred. And uh, so he seemed to think it was valuable. It's not my judgment, it's his. No, he thought it was no, useful. No, it's his that, judgment from his diary. The evidence of the existence of Freemasonry, other than within the context, in England at least, I'm not talking about Scotland. In England, at least, other than the context of livery companies, is minimal. Now, every livery company, no matter what trade it belonged to, used to honor individuals by making them members, which was equivalent to being a speculative Freemason, speculative members, in other words, members of the livery company. Yeah, I mean, the Lodge of Aberdeen was doing it 100 years before, so it's not it's exactly. not normal. Well, because you know, look, look at the Aberdeen Mark book. Because operative masonry is likely to have begun in Scotland without question. Speculative masonry is likely to have begun in England around the 1670s. But no, I doubt that. Look, look, at the, look at the evidence of the Kirkwall Scroll. It shows clear evidence of speculative masonry and it's carbon dated to 1480, which yeah, is extremely very, very embarrassing. How, do, how can you possibly interpret speculative masonry? Look at the symbols. Well, what, what have, you at, have you looked at the Kirkwall scroll? Is, it's just just take a blather going a series of steps to a mystical centre. Yeah, just just for your information, Robert, uh, Philip Harris delivered a presentation ba based on your material on the Kirkwall wall to uh, the Earl Spencer Lodge and a number mm. of uh, participants within which Yasha as well. Mm. Although that's carbon, that's been carbon dated to to fourteen eighty. Yeah, but there is nothing that is speculative that is Freemasonry. 
What do you interpret to be Freemasonry? Were symbols that were used some of the yes, way? I don't think Freemasonry existed before the Kirkwall Scroll. I think it's the first attempt to develop speculative Freemasonry. I, I just don't know how to respond to that. Look at the evidence in the in the in the dating. So what happened? The the why self, don't, why don't we have a continue? Why don't we have a continuous run of Freemasonry evidence, including incidentally in the last national exist. diary? Why do you think that Nice Ashmore doesn't actually mention Freemasonry except on the two occasions of his initiation and the visit to London? That's because a good he, question. Saw it, he saw it purely and simply as a means of getting preferment. And what, what it did do was gain him access to Sir Robert Murray, who was a Freemason, without doubt, because you can see his, uh, his certificate of initiation. Yes, it was a, a perfect example, Antonio. Yeah, yeah. yeah Robert, but Robert, may I ask you something? You, you, you said you went through all these diaries and there are five volumes of immaterial yeah. about it. What I find Spend extremely... Doing it. Yeah. <laughs> no, what, what I find a, a, extremely peculiar in all of this is during my research, as I announced in the profiling of Elias Ashmore, there are only two entries about Freemasonry in his diaries. Yeah. How is it I, possible that there is nothing else? I mean, the guy was documenting going and picking up a horse here, going out for a drink yeah. there. But because why he Freemasonry was he not... Once, it, once, he'd, once he'd used Freemasonry to get out, to get access to London, he forgot about it, took no more interest in it, as he did with other people. The moment Don't you he think there's, there's as much, much of a likelihood that Freemasonry simply didn't exist to any extent of consequence for him to justify a second annotation? The Shaw statutes would argue differently. I'm not talking about Scotland. I'm talking oh, about England. I am, because James... James yeah, but you're talking in 100% operative. James, James I of England and brought it down with him. That's how it happened to be in Warrington by then. But you can't put the Shaw statutes in, in the context of speculative Freemason. It's only operative. Of course I can, because it says very clearly we have the second sight and the Mason's word. That's speculative. That's not speculative at all. Every stone mason, every stone mason will have his second sight as well. Stone masons were extremely religious. Many of them mythical. Many of them uh, spiritual. Yeah. They, they used exactly the same symbols that you are talking about, which became obviously symbols that were used by operative masons, by speculative masons later. But tell yeah. me, there is, but you, there you've is, also got you've also got the the evidence. Of the of the early 1600s from the Lodge of Aberdeen of them taking in uh, tradesmen as speculative masons to you've take got, the means of the craft. You've got that earlier with scriveners that are invited to join lodges in in, in order because of the masons being uneducated. Yes. Have, so you, have, you, have you read um, David Stevenson's The Origins of Freemasonry? It's my Bible. <laughs> well, he talked about the Mason standing beside the king at, the, uh, at the foundation of King's College. Look at look at the evidence he puts for for the art of memory, the use of the Mason's word, and the second sight. That's speculative. I, I'm really fascinated to the to interpretation of speculative. What I can tell you is that if a mason is a stone mason, is an, is an individual man, stands next to a cathedral and turns to you and says, look, I built this building, this cathedral. Imagine the awesomeness of the respect you would have for such a man that was actually involved in the creation of that building. Mm. It was natural to have natural respect and even to have indications of superhuman powers to have been able to, especially dedicated to God, of course. Mm. So whether this, but this, this aspect of a respect towards a stone mason doesn't make him, a, uh, doesn't make him a speculative mason. It keeps him in a speculative state of mind. It's, it's extremely strange that you find all the elements that we use in all the degrees on the Kirkwall scroll carbon dated to 1480 when free and i accept freemasonry didn't exist then but i found the masonic symbols in egyptian artifacts as well yes but you didn't find so many concentrated i mean we have i've had these arguments before about pro, about density of probability and you don't find as many in one place as you do on the kirkwall scroll a single sign 
in terms of Einstein, a low probability. Put them all together and the probability gets higher. Well, I'm sure there is another way of quantum physics proving that it isn't so. <laughs> no, that was statistics, not quantum <laughs> physics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But let, let's for a second get back to Elias Ashmole and his period. So I, I understand the Kirchhoff's war. This is a subject that I'm sure we will have the, oppo the opportunity. It's a totally different subject. Exactly. It's red like... herring as regards Ashmole's character. <laughs> <laughs> But again, why a person that has such an impact in marking English Freemasonry does not have any entry in his diary except for two meetings, <coughs> doesn't have any you know, part active participation, etc. Yasha, where do you see, because you are the one that sees Ashmore correctly as a character larger than life, where was his main contribution then to Freemasonry? Well, first of all, let's put the uh, impact in its correct context. There was no impact that Ashmore, Ashmore himself had on Freemasonry at the time of, uh, that he was a Freemason. The impact is only that he's the first English, in fact, after Moray. I don't want to get into that argument. <laughs> <laughs> I take note for another uh, another recording 16, about this. 1641. <laughs> 1641. So see, we've got an initiation in 1646, the first Englishman. Yeah. So that's all. I mean, he didn't do very much on top of that on Freemasonry, except according to Robert using it. I, I don't think I don't think he, where he was forbidden to go. <laughs> yeah, but, but he was. So, they're unconnected incidents. These are obvious. No, no. So together. People act, people act on their own impulses. He wouldn't have bothered trailing all the way up to Warrington, spent two days getting initiated, and then dashed right back to London. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have, London, he would have gone there directly. He wouldn't he, have he done it. The passport. He, he wouldn't have done it without making a note in his extensive diaries where he was annotating everything. Hmm? He made he all the notes. Written and said, "I am going to London." Like he said that he was invited to attend the meeting in 1682. Yeah. That was probably the next time he bothered to have anything to do with it once he got what he needed out of it. Well, not according like to you. According else, to, he away from it. According to you, he needed them used them all the time yeah. without he, recording. He had, without no, he, had, he, had of no money, he had no job. He'd just been forbidden from entering, from earning his living, living as a solicitor in London, by the uh, by the act of surrender. He was he was down totally destitute. And he went to his to his cousin, Colonel Henry Mannering, who was a colonel in Cromwell's army, and said, "Can you get me back into London?" And Mannering proposed him into the into the lodge, into the Warrington Lodge, and he promptly rode back to London. And he meet, and he then met with all the people arrested. Why did he need Freemasonry to do that? He could have introduced him to the parliamentarians directly. Uh, no, he'd been forbidden by by act of Parliament to to go back to London. But uh, you just said he, wanted, he did go he back to London. The security of being uh, of having some sort of secret to share with the people, particularly Lily. I think he was the one he was really interested in. Lily and Orchard. Is this the subject of one of your books, by the way? Um. Is this the subject of one of your books, Elias Ashmore going to London? Uh, I've written a whole chapter about it in the Invisible College. With all with all the evidence from the diaries footnoted in it, it should have been called the Invisible Evidence. Mm -hmm. That was the Invisible College. <laughs> the invisible the evidence college. isn't invisible; it's in Ashmole's own hand. Yeah. I mean, I, I can I can quote long and salacious comments that he makes if you want, but no, I, prefer, I, I prefer not to not to impugn him that badly. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think he been. The Ashmolean collection benefited science, the Bodleian benefited science, and the fact that he he can be held up as an early English Freemason also is a benefit. But I think the man himself, I don't have a lot of respect for. And I did start with a totally blank sheet when I first looked at him. I was interested in Robert Murray, who I have a great deal of respect for. And I studied Ashmole to find out how he interacted with Murray. But I mean, even even Murray says of him, they only wanted him for his money. Once they got him into the Royal Society, he never attended. He just paid his fees. Why did Robert Murray become a Freemason? Hmm? Robert Murray became a Freemason because he was actually he was actually interested in the ideas behind it. He was interested in the way it organized people, in the way it brought people together. And in the way it taught brotherly love, relief, and truth, 
And you can Operate see that there. You're talking of operative masonry. No, M Robert Murray was no operative mason. Come on, he was a so where did he, where he was, did he get where did he get any information of the of this love? I mean, the guy the guy who, initi who initiated him was a general in the Covenanters army. He wasn't an operative Freemason. Can I ask a question to both of you? Uh, and, and I leave Murray because I, I really think we need to do a, a, another show about Murray himself. But Ashmore back again. I find it interesting. Robert, you say he used Freemasonry for his own interest, and you gave a number of examples. Yasha, you say, well, actually, you know, Freemasonry benefited from him. Now, the question is if he was so well connected, there wasn't an interest of the Freemasons of the time to use uh, uh, Elias Ashmo as a vehicle to power, politics, exposure, and therefore attract more Masons. Was that Freemasonry using Elias' name? I don't think so, because he didn't have a name at the time. The the reputation Yash is talking about, he got after the return of Charles II. But he it was still a Freemason Mason in the reign of Charles I. Once he got that name, Republic. once he got... Once he got that positive reputation, there's no reason why he shouldn't have been a positive influence for the Freemasons to use him. Yeah, but he, he, he used people and moved on and never went back to them. He used Freemasonry for the purpose he had and then he moved on. He remained a Freemason and was invited to attend the... Yeah, for 35 years. He, that yeah, that, that knows for about 35 years. Once you made a Freemason, you're always a Freemason. Yeah, but um, Robert, if I take the Ashmolean profile, the restoration of Charles II is 1660. The notes in uh, Elias' diary is 1682, where he is invited to be a, a yeah. senior fellow. So he was already a, a Freemason and yeah, he was that, connected to court. That's not the one he was initiated. Okay. It's the point he was initiated that matters. That's yeah. when he was... That's no, no. When he it was, was, was about my question that Freemasonry used him at Freemasonry interest in order to access Charles II and at all the, the network. Meeting, at the second meeting, it probably did. Because if you look at who was present at that meeting, you can find a lot of the people who were involved in the formation of the Royal Society. So I would agree with you that Freemasonry was probably using in him by then, I see. rather than the other way around. But when he joined, it was the other way around. Yeah, no, no. He was definitely destitute. And he admits it himself in his own diary, Asher. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, that, that uh, I, I, please, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please correct me, uh, Robert, if I say something incorrect now. Rob, uh, Yasha mentioned before, as an ambitious man that was trying to make his name into the society of the time, he tried to use all the possible access to power, politics, and, and wealth. And Freemasons seems to me like it was a way for him to access this uh, one of these uh, elements. Therefore, he did what any one of us, at a certain moment of his life, when he sees an opportunity to access fame, power, politics, etc., play the rules of the game, and later in life, that organization will then use your notoriety to then attract more power. Yes, but uh, <coughs> the question in my mind is what was motivating him, yeah. and he shows a consistent pattern of behavior throughout his whole life of using people and moving on. Yeah. When he gets what he wants, when he gets the uh, the next letter of recommendation to move to Worcester as uh, as master of the uh, as master of the exchequer, yeah, he takes it and he forgets the guy who's given it him. Robert, you sound you, you make him sound as if he was an exception to a rule. Oh, everybody, no, he, everybody who has got that. ambitions in life to get anywhere and uses people and uses power around him. There was nothing he, exceptional in Elias Ashmole trying to better himself. Uh, no, but as an example, as an example of a Freemasonry, is a very poor one, because there is a, a contemporary example, Sir Robert Murray, who does exemplify exactly what Freemasonry stands for. Murray belonged to an operative lodge. Hmm? Murray belonged to Edinburgh is not an Edinburgh, Edinburgh is not an operative lodge. Saint Mary Edinburgh. You're talking about Saint Mary's. No, I'm talking about the Lodge of Edinburgh. I thought I thought he had been initiated in the 
No, he was initiated as a field, as on a field warrant issued by the Lodge of Edinburgh in Newcastle in 1641 by General Hamilton, who was not an operative Freemason. No. Sorry, he was not an operative Mason. Yeah. <laughs> he was a Freemason. I see the argument, uh, Robert, in, in the sense that he, he was just taking advantage of his uh, of the opportunities. But that somehow supports what Yasha is saying, is that, well, that's pretty normal, isn't it? That's what any 20 years old ambitious guy, and if you go back in century, it would be probably 16 years old, depending on mm -hmm. you know, how early you could start. He took advantage. What I am amazed is, and there I see your argument, Robert, he didn't do anything with Freemasonry. He no. got the he got the the the, the what's that the first fellow craft senior uh, senior fellow title, and then he just continued doing his writing of books on alchemy and uh, astrology etc. But Freemasonry he didn't really dig into it actively. No. Well, if you if you look at Murray as a contemporary, Murray did maintain an interest in Freemasonry, and he wrote about aspects of it. And you keep on going, keep on going back into Scottish Freemasonry, and you can't do that. Of there's course, a, yeah, there was there's Scottish Freemasonry. There is a definite parallel run between Freemasonry in Scotland, that is essentially operative with speculative presence in it, and Freemasonry in England, which is essentially speculative. Yeah, but don't don't forget James the Sixth was made a was made a Freemason at the Lodge of Schoon and Perth in sixteen oh one and he then became James the First of England. He brought Freemasonry with him. Ah. This one I don't have any, I don't have anything on this one. <laughs> it's well it's well known. John no, it's not well known. It's, well it's very well known in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> in Scotland. <laughs> it's just ignored in London. <laughs> it's known, well known in the north of England as well. It's well, in Bar in Barnet it's known that I'm a Grand Master. Mm -hmm. in, Barnet, in Barnet it's known that I'm a Grand Master. <laughs> <laughs> Yasha, Robert, I am overwhelmed by your presentation. Not just the historical references, your knowledge about Elijah, Elias Ashmo, but the passion and the involvement and the capability to make such a character become real once again in our time. Now, to the viewer of this video, what now? Well, first question, what do you think about the arguments of the speakers? With whom do you agree or you disagree and why? Were you aware of all the information that was presented to you today? If you were convinced by Yasha or Robert, then allow me to challenge you. Go and investigate the argument of the opposite, the defense or the prosecutor in this case, and try to find why you were right. Next, we will invite some experts to review this video. We will ask them to join us, and we will ask them to actually present the conclusion based on what Yash and Robert have recorded in this video. But allow me to close with this message. We, the three of us, hope that you have found new motivation to learn more about Freemason history, the characters, the personages that contributed in what Freemasonry is today. And that will become a new drive to learn more about your Masonic journey. Yasha, Robert, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for this conversation. I truly enjoyed it. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Yasha. I, I do applaud your attempt to, per, to bring out his good side. I've listened carefully. <laughs> I'm, af I'm afraid I still don't like the man, but I understand him a little better. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. I hope you will soon be friends. <laughs> I'm friends with you, but I, I don't think I'd ever be friends with, uh, with, with Ashmole. I wouldn't have allowed my wife within 20 yards of him. <laughs>